Well, good morning, everybody. Spring is a beautiful time of the year. Don't you think so? I don't think I have ever noticed so many blossoms on our trees at home. We've got a lot of fruit trees. And if we got fruit from all of them, I think we'd be bringing quite a lot of it here to church. Something else I just noticed yesterday, although Len says he's seen it before, but we've got three peach trees out the side of our lounge room. And the tuis have been in there this year. I've never seen them there before. There's heaps and heaps of tuis around. But I said to them, you enjoy those blossoms because you're very welcome to them. I've also noticed too that the um, trees are starting to put forward their little buds and take time to notice these beautiful things that God has provided for us. And we can enjoy the new life that is coming through now. Let's just bow our heads. Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we pray that you'll give me the words to speak. Help me to be able to have your spirit here, and that you will take hold of my mouth, we ask in your name. Amen. Everyone has got a story to tell. Whether you've been in the church, where you were brought up in the church, and you've just sort of grown on, along the way, or perhaps you've had a, a, a dramatic experience whereby you have come into the church. We all don't have an experience like Saul had, do we? And uh, he, <clears throat> he had the experience that perhaps some of us would like to have. <clears throat> Those born of the Adventist parentage may have grown and just coasted along. Now I'd like us to consider a few people in the Bible and see what this encounter was like. First of all, I'd like to talk about Jairus. Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue and his job was to supervise the school. For the, it was for the boys. The girls didn't go to school, but the boys had their schooling there. It was his job also to um, arrange for the preachers or the teachers to do the work on the Sabbath, and he was a big man. Now, there's this time when he is in trouble. Well, at least his daughter's in trouble. He has been um, to, Jesus has been to leave our Matthew's house, and there's been a feast there in his honour, and there were many publicans there as well. And this is where we first hear of Jairus. And um, he came to Jesus and he fell at Jesus' feet. Now, this was quite something for a, for a ruler to do. But he said to Jesus, I implore you to come because my daughter, my only daughter, is sick and she's nigh unto death. And I wish that I want you to come and heal her. Well, Jesus went without any question. In fact, the, um, the disciples were a little bit surprised at Jesus' willingness to go with Jairus because Jairus was a haughty man. And I guess he would be, un he'd be just like all the other rabbis. They were haughty people because they thought that they were something special. But Jesus went. <clears throat> and... Because, because Jesus was the kind of person that he was, it took quite a long time for them to get from where Jairus first met him to Jairus' house. And um, there were interruptions on the way. There, was, there were many people who wanted to be healed, and so Jesus stopped to heal each one of them as he went along. <clears throat> Well, the house was not that far away, but because of the crowd, they made slow progress. And Jairus was rather impatient. He was just wanting Jesus to get to his house, but he would stop, as I said, to comfort a suffering one or to comfort a, a troubled soul. Then before they got to the house, a messenger pressed through the crowd and said, don't bother the master anymore because your daughter has died. But Jesus said, don't be afraid, only believe and she will be made whole. Well, already the hired mourners, 
have arrived at the house and this flute playing a rather doogee doogee sort of a song. And uh, I got this from the message, actually. If If you're familiar with reading the message, it's quite good. The gossips were there looking for a story and the neighbours were bringing in their casseroles. So don't you think that's quite... That's what we do, too, now, don't we? Well, Jesus said, don't be worried, and he and Peter and James and John and the parents went up to the upper room where the child was lying. And, uh, of course, the other disciples were just waiting down below. I guess they were trying to keep the crowd quiet. But we know what happened. Jesus said to the girl, she was 12 years old, and as I said before, she was the only daughter. Therefore, she would have been very special in her parents' eyes. And so, what did he say? He said, little girl, I say unto you, arise. When she was healed, which happened immediately, the people were greatly astonished. Now, whose faith was it that helped this little girl come back to life? Was it the disciples? Was it the little girls? No, it couldn't be. Was it, the, was it the parents? I think it probably was the parents. But after Jesus had healed this little girl, he said, give her something to eat. But he also said, don't tell anyone what has happened. Now, why would Jesus say that? One, Jesus didn't want to be known as a miracle worker. He had concerns for his ministry And he wanted the facts to speak for themselves. He wanted people to listen to his words directly. That is, words that would heal their broken lives. So, we don't hear any more of Jairus after this. Of course, on the way, we know that he stopped to heal this woman who had been ill for many years. We don't even know her name, but she had suffered this disability for about 12 years and she had used all her money up going to various so-called doctors so that she would be relieved of the problem. She had been hoping for a cure, but there was no cure. If you imagine that you had been hemorrhaging, as it were, for 12 years, you haven't got a lot of strength in your body. And she was very desperate for a cure. She, her desire was, if only I could get to Jesus, he would heal me. In weakness and suffering, she came to the seaside where Jesus was teaching and tried to press through the crowd. But no, she just couldn't reach him. She followed him from the house of Levi Matthew, or Matthew Levi, and she was still unable to reach him. She was just in absolute despair. Then he came near to where she was. She was desperate. She thought to herself, If only I could reach out and touch his garment. And so that is exactly what she did. Just remember that she was a social outcast because of her bleeding. She was excluded from the synagogue. But she knew that her bleeding would cause Jesus to be unclean under the Jewish law if she touched him. But in her desperation, she put that aside. In Luke 8.45, we have that story. Jesus knew who touched him all the while, but he wanted the woman to step forward and identify herself and witness to all around. She, on the other hand, at that stage, she tried to withdraw because she did not want to have to tell her story. She was ashamed. But Jesus knew who had touched him. Jesus also knew that this woman had been looking for him And he made a point of being in that right place at the right time so that she could touch him. So Jesus said, who touched me? And she couldn't hide any longer and she came forward trembling. With grateful tears, she told the story of her suffering and now she had found relief. Instantly healed, Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. And that is the last that we hear of her. So I say, we don't even know her name. Now we come to the story of the ten lepers. Now I know that you know all this story. One of those lepers was a Samaritan. And the requirements for a leper was that 
you just kept yourself away from other people. You had to announce your presence if you did come near people. It was a very miserable life. Your family from a distance might provide you with food. Your clothes were rags and your limbs could, be, could rot at the extremities. Now I've had experience with lepers. I worked in Papua New Guinea for two years on a leper colony and we had over 200 people who had leprosy. Now, there are two types of leprosy. One is more severe than another. And we would have whole families that would come in because they had leprosy and they had to be treated. And oftentimes, they, well, they did. They have to have medicine every day, probably for the rest of their lives. I don't really know how, what leprosy is like these days. I'm not up with the play in any way at all, so I don't know what the treatment is. But in those days, the, the uh, people with the, more, the worst kind of leprosy would lose um, their nerve endings and the blood circulation was very, very poor in their feet and their arms and their hands. And oftentimes, the fingers would resolve and the toes as well, but also where we were, we were right on the coast, and a lot of these people liked to do fishing. So they would go out on the rocks, and they couldn't feel the rocks, cut their feet, and then subsequently they would get ulcers on their feet, and those ulcers would not heal because the blood supply was so poor. So we used to dress these ulcers every day, and um, because because of the, the blood supply, you would have this pocket of skin that would grow over the ulcer, but then you've got this pocket underneath, and of course, subsequently, there would be infection there. So what did we do? Well, we had to cut away the old skin. They didn't feel it, but it's just a little bit nerve-wracking to do it for the first time. So as I say, I don't know how people are treated these days, but hopefully it's a bit better than the old days. Now Jesus was travelling to Jerusalem and he travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And these ten men who had leprosy called at him from a distance and said to him, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Jesus didn't touch them. He just said, go, show yourselves to the priests. Well, they went off, they were obedient, and they went off and they were healed. But one leper, the Samaritan, the only Samaritan among them, came back to Jesus and thanked him and praised God. Were there not ten lepers clean, said Jesus, but where are the nine? It is possible to receive God's gift with an ungrateful heart. In this age of materialism, we are out for all we can get for as little as possible. God doesn't demand that we thank him, but he is pleased when we do so. The Samaritan belonged to a race of people who were utterly despised by the Jewish race. They called them idolatrous half-breeds. Really? That's the last we hear of the leper. Now, there's a little story about Lazarus in John 11. Lazarus was a great friend of Jesus. Their house in Bethany was one where Jesus loved to visit. He enjoyed going there because he could relax, away from the maddening crowd, and I'm sure that Martha was a good cook as well. Now, Jesus was in another area when he got the message that Lazarus was sick. By the time Jesus got to Bethany, Lazarus had been dead four days. We know these stories. They're not new to us. I'm just trying to find another little slant on them. Of course, this delay was on purpose. Jesus knew what he was going to do. Jesus was about to perform his greatest miracle. One of the few times we learn that Jesus wept, and the people round about said, oh, how he loved him. No, he wasn't weeping for Lazarus because he was going to raise him from the dead, wasn't he? He was, he was weeping because of the unbelief of the people. The family were bitterly disappointed that Jesus hadn't come earlier in the peace because they knew that Jesus could heal Lazarus and they were very disappointed. But when he was brought out from the tomb, great was their joy. 
when he came forth from, from the tomb. <clears throat> Later on, Simeon, who was a leper, he was a Pharisee, and Jesus healed him of his disease. And Simeon gave a feast for Jesus to thank him for healing him. Now there were, he gave this meal in honour of Jesus to show his gratitude. Many Jews were present at the feast and they expected to hear from Lazarus, because he was there too, a wonderful account of scenes witnessed after his death. They were surprised that he told them nothing. He had nothing to tell. But he did have a wonderful testimony. With assurance and power, he declared that Jesus was the Son of God. Well, with this sort of a explanation and a, the, the uh, people that were there at that feast were not happy and they viewed um, Lazarus with very unfriendly eyes. They wanted to put him to death as well. That didn't happen, of course. But the next thing that we hear about Lazarus is that he led the cult that took Jesus into Jerusalem, remember, of the day that he made that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. On the day that Christ's death, there were three men that differed widely from one another. They declared their faith. There was the man that carried the cross for Christ, that was Simon of Cyrene, the thief who died next to his side, and the centurion, the captain of the Roman guard. Christ's death was accompanied by four, at least four, miraculous events. Darkness covered the earth, the wrong time of the day, and the veil in the temple was ripped without a man's hand involved in any way at all, and a violent earthquake, and the rocks split open. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many of holy people were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into Jerusalem and appeared to many. When this, all these things were happening, the priests that were present there at the crucifixion, and the rulers, the soldiers, the executioners, and the people lay prostrate on the ground. In fact, they were mute with terror. When the darkness was lifted from the cross and the Saviour's dying cry had been uttered, another voice was heard. You can read about it in Matthew twenty-seven fifty-four. Truly, this was the Son of God. All eyes turned to see where it had come from, who had spoken. It was the centurion, the leader of the hundred soldiers, he could not refrain from confessing his faith. Well, I could have highlighted many other people. There's the story of Zacchaeus, there's Matthew, Levi, there's Martha, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, the widow who gave her two mites. These people might have grown old in the faith. They may have been put to death when um, so many Christians lost their lives, when Jerusalem was overthrown. Many people that Jesus healed were present at his crucifixion and joined in the cries of crucify him, crucify him. That's what you call mob spirit, isn't it? Others were there that were extremely disappointed because they were sure that Christ was going to set up his own earthly kingdom. Others watched on in great wonder and sympathy. Others later that weekend came and wanted healing from the great healer. So people that had been on the outskirts of Jerusalem and they brought their, their sick in because they wanted Jesus to heal them, but the healer had gone. Well, so what relevance to us today? What does this have for us? Well, it's interesting and it increases our faith and knowledge to know about the characters Jesus had healed and disputed with. In fact, if you read the last verse of John, chapter 21 and verse 25, John talks about things that Jesus had done. If every one of those things that Jesus had done, all the healings, the teachings, if it was all written down, this is what John says, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would have been written.
we have really bigger concerns than knowing about all the people that have gone before us. One, we can come to Jesus through curiosity. Two, we can come to him when there's no one else to turn to and we are in despair. I remember saying that to my older son one day. I said, I am sure that when people are in trouble and there's nowhere else to go, I said, that you, it's the most natural thing in the world to turn to Jesus because we know there is a power there. Three, we can come to him because of the situations we are in. Perhaps it's financial, sickness, work or lack of it, and relationships. Many people have a head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. And as we see the day approaching, don't turn to Jesus as your last gasp. The important thing for us, life-saving in fact, is that we respond to Christ while there is still opportunity. Faith releases God's healing power. His mercy equals healing body, soul and spirit. So I started off by saying that everybody has a story. So what is your story? No one else but you can tell it. So I'd like us to sing our last hymn, I Know in Whom I Have Believed. This is a favourite hymn of mine, and today it was really good to have some of the old songs I haven't sung for many, many years. I sort of determined I wasn't going to sing today, save my voice, but I just couldn't help it. Hymn number 511 if you're using your hymn book. 